In the dark and often dangerous world of prisons, unexpected alliances and rivalries may be formed between members of different organizations. This intriguing dynamic is evident in the relationship between the Hells Angels and various cartels behind bars. In today's video, I will be taking a look at what happens between drug cartels and Hells Angels motorcycle club members in jail, Hells Angels versus cartels. Many prisons around the world are plagued with the presence of inmates who are affiliated with different gangs and criminal organizations. While some of these gangs are formed behind bars as a means of surviving the difficult life that exists in prison, others are made up of members of already existing gangs and criminal groups who are incarcerated together. Judging from their seemingly different values and shared criminal histories, when members of cartels and Hells Angels are locked up in the same space, it is easy to see why it doesn't take long for them to form bonds or rivalries. In the outside world, it's possible for the different cartels and the Hells Angels to operate with minimal interactions. However, the intricacies of navigating life in prison present an entirely different playing field. A Hells Angels member who is new to the prison system may hang on to the club's reputation and values only for him to find that there are members or other organizations behind bars who do not share his beliefs. The same goes for drug lords, who are used to calling the shots in nearly all circumstances, and cartel members who have been trained to turn to violence whenever they come face to face with members of another group. Based on their differences, it is very likely that Hell's Angels may end up in competition with cartel members in prison for a host of reasons. But when push comes to shove, the groups may have to form alliances to keep their heads afloat. Before we delve into the intricacies of the interactions between the Hells Angels and cartel members in jail, it is imperative to understand the origins of both organizations, their values, and the mindsets of their members. Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, HAMC. The Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, also called the HA, Red and White, or 81 Inches, is an outlaw motorcycle club that is recognized internationally. Having over 6,000 members in 467 chapters spread across 59 countries in the world, Hells Angels Motorcycle Club members are known to ride Harley-Davidson motorcycles. Much of the Outlaw Motorcycle Club's history is shrouded in mystery. However, the available information suggests that the club came into existence in March 1948 in Fontana, California. It was formed by merging several already existing motorcycle clubs whose members agreed it would be better to come together and form a big club. One of the prominent names attributed to the formation of the club is Otto Friedli, who was a World War II veteran. According to some accounts, Friedli was a former member of the Pissed Off Bastards Motorcycle Club, who broke out of the club following a fight against a rival motorcycle club. Another man who allegedly played a significant role in the formation of the Hells Angels is Dick White. Some accounts say that he founded the group in November 1951. Unfortunately, there is no way to ascertain the original founder of the Hells Angels Club because different sources have different stories of the club's early history. Things began to get a bit clearer around 1950, when the club put together its first official chapter in Fontana, California. For the following decade, nomadic Hells Angels traveled from one city to another, spreading the word and creating various chapters of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club in as many cities as they could. Yet another aspect of the Hells Angels that has more than one story is the topic of how the club got its name. The Hells Angels official website says a man named Arvid Olsen was the first to suggest the name. Arvid had a connection to the club's founders and suggested the name because he had fought in World War II and served in the Hells Angels Squadron of the Flying Tigers in China. The story put out on the club's website is however opposed by a letter written by a member of the organization to the Guinness Book of World Records. In the letter, the writer stated that the club got its name from the Hells Angels Squadron of the 303rd Bombardment Group, a group that thrived in the European theater of World War II. Whatever the case, it is safe to say that the club got its name from the fierce and terrifying titles American squadrons were known for during the war. On the official Hells Angels website, the club affirmed the missing apostrophe in the Hells Angels name, stating that it was not an oversight. As the years rolled by, the number of HAMC members slowly increased and multiplied in various cities as nomads from already established chapters continued to take on the task of moving from city to city with the goal of establishing new chapters. In 1956 and 1957, two chapters were established in North Sacramento and in Sacramento, 
by two brothers, James, Mother Miles, and Pat Miles. The brothers belonged to the Hell Bent for Glory Biker Club before leaving to join the Hells Angels. Still, in 1957, another chapter was founded in Oakland by Ralph Sonny Barger. As new chapters continued to be established, it became came clear that not all who joined were aware of the existence of their forebears. Notwithstanding, the club continued its steady growth in California until 1961, when the first chapter to be established outside California was founded in Auckland, New Zealand, becoming an angel. Although the Hells Angels Club was spreading into new cities, the club wasn't open to just anyone. Anyone who wanted to join had to go through the appropriate process. The first step to becoming a full member of the Hells Angels Club is to start as a prospect. Every prospect must have a motorcycle over 750 cc, a valid driver's license, and a set of character traits that suit the club's morals. As a motorcycle club, it is expected that having a motorcycle is mandatory. But the Hells Angels take things a step further. They are famous for riding Harley Davidson bikes, although some chapters accept other motorcycle brands. The club is strictly against child molesters, candidates who have at one point applied to become prison officers or police officers. The exclusion of police applicants is mostly an attempt to prevent undercover cops from infiltrating the gang. The club also has a strict policy against the use of intravenous drugs and members must obey the rule or stand a chance of getting kicked out. An accepted prospect goes through different phases of the process for a long period before they are bumped up to the next stage, which is the hangaround. The hangarounds get invitations to attend some events, and they get the chance to meet established members of the club during these events. In the next phase of the process, the hangaround is invited to be an associate. This is the longest phase of the process, as one may remain an associate for as long as two years before getting to the last stage of the process. In the last stage, the associate is once again identified as a prospect, but this time, they are allowed to participate in some activities, however, they are not given any voting rights. To attain full membership status, or full patch, members of the club that have already attained the status have to unanimously agree and vote for the prospect to get the full patch. But before they vote, the prospect has to visit other chapters and introduce himself to every full patch member he meets. During this time, the full patch members get to know the prospect well enough to decide if they would vote in the prospect's favor to become a full member. When the prospect finally becomes a full member, he is awarded the full patch, which is a four-piece insignia that includes the Death Head logo, a top rocker, a bottom rocker, and a rectangular MC patch placed underneath the wing of the Death Head. Getting the full patch signifies full membership to the club. However, the patches still belong to the club. Any member leaving the club must return the patches. Full members are tasked to pay dues and attend compulsory meetings known as church, which usually take place in clubhouses or a member's house. The dues paid by members are used to fund funerals, motorcycle runs, and to help pay for club officers who travel to different states for meetings. To date, the HAMC claim they are a harmless club of motorcycle enthusiasts, but members of the club have gotten involved in various crimes, including drug trafficking and murder. The United States Department of Justice, as well as other intelligence bodies of the world, regard the club as an organized crime syndicate. The HAMC may have started out as an innocent establishment, but over the years there have been drastic changes in the club. In recent times, many of the club's members have been known to dabble into all sorts of illegal activities. Between 1994 and 2002, the Hells Angels in Quebec were involved in a turf war because they were trying to monopolize the drug trade in the streets of Quebec. Several drug dealers in the area formed groups to resist the Hells Angels, and in no time a serious war that involved several bombings broke out. The war ended in 2002 with over 160 dead, more than 300 injured people, and over 100 bikers locked up in jail. In the recent past, an increased number of Hells Angels members have been incarcerated for various reasons, including murder, drug trafficking, and misuse of firearms. A few popular members of the club that have been jailed include Adam Lee Hall, who was convicted of three counts of murder, kidnapping, and witness intimidation. Hall, alongside two other members, was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of three men. In 2022, three members of the Hells Angels Club in Sonoma County were convicted of murder and racketeering. Jonathan Nelson, Russell Taylor Ott, and Brian Wayne Went worked together to kill a fellow club member, Joel Silver, because they thought he was causing problems for the club. As you would expect, Hells Angels who are imprisoned tend to hold on to their identity and sense of community even behind bars. This, of course, goes on to play a significant role in their interactions with members of other groups, drug cartels, and drug lords. While the HAMC is a group of motorcyclists who have been accused of venturing into the sale of drugs and other criminal activities, drug cartels are criminal organizations run by drug lords 
who control the production, supply, and price of illegal substances in various areas. Drug lords form these well-funded and properly structured groups with the main aim of supplying and trafficking drugs, but it is not unusual for them to venture into other criminal activities. The number one tool used by cartels to establish dominance is violence, and so wherever there is a drug cartel, there is violence. Now keep this in mind as we continue this story because it explains a lot about their interactions with the Hells Angels in prison. The cartel's control of violence is often employed as a tool to ward off rival cartels or as a means to take control of new territories and business areas. Every well-planned cartel operates within a structure that clearly stipulates the roles and positions of each member. The highest position is held by the drug lords, who generally overlook and supervise the entire organization. The drug lord works on providing funds, making alliances, strategizing, ordering hits, and the day-to-day -day operations of the cartel. The second in command to the drug lord is known as a lieutenant. They run smaller factions of the cartel in different territories. They also supervise the hitmen and falcons within their jurisdiction of the cartel. The lieutenants have the authority to order hits and do not need to ask permission from their overall boss. The next rank in the cartel system is occupied by hitmen or assassins who serve as the soldiers and footmen for the cartel. Hitmen are in charge of carrying out hits, kidnapping, extortion, thefts, racketeering, and protecting the cartel and drug lords from the police and other cartels. The last rank in the cartel system is held by falcons these are people who serve as lookouts for the gang. Falcons are the eyes and the ears on the streets. They go around and gather as much information as they can and report back to the cartels. This is the lowest rank in any drug cartel as they are not considered official members of the cartel. In most cartel structures, these are the most common ranks, but there are other people who work within the cartel that do not necessarily have a rank. The people who work in the production arm of the cartel and the people who smuggle the drugs are also integral parts of the cartel they are also very likely to get arrested and sent to prison. Other members of the cartel include distributors, accountants, and people who help launder the money earned from the dealings. Another important sector of the cartel is the people tasked with supplying the heavy artillery required to win the gang wars and carry out their brutality to gain the fear of the people. There are dozens of drug cartels in existence all around the world, but Mexico is home to perhaps the most number of cartels in a country. Mexican cartels produce, import, and smuggle thousands of tons of illegal drugs into the United States yearly. However, the excessive number of cartels in the country has brought about stiff competition between the cartels, which in turn results in rival gangs engaging in fights and killing each other as well as innocent citizens caught in the crossfire. Drug lords are famous for ordering and carrying out coordinated attacks on politicians, government officials, journalists, and police officers who try to stand in the way of their business. A 2020 report done by the Congressional Research Service, or CRS, shows that between 2006 and 2018, the country had witnessed about 125,000 to 150,000 homicides that were organized by different drug cartels in the country. Famous drug lords who have been incarcerated include Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, leader of the Guadalajara cartel, Osiel Cardenas Guillén, who led Los Zetas cartel, and Griselda Blanco, who was popularly known as the godmother of cocaine. While there are so many cartels in existence, there are a few cartels that have been marked as the worst of the worst due to their manner of operations and ability to evade government and affinity to violence. And they're the ones that the Hells Angels either fear or are eager to work with in and out of prison. The worst cartels in the world. There are three cartels that are the most terrifying and have the largest monopoly on sheer violence today. These Mexican cartels are the Sinaloa cartel, the CJNG cartel, and the Los Zetas cartel. Now, you see, the Sinaloa cartel is one of the strongest cartels to exist in Mexico. The cartel, also known as the Federation or the Blood Alliance, is a very notorious crime group that has continually defied government efforts to eliminate cartels in Mexico. The Sinaloa cartel gets its roots from the Guadalajara cartel and originated in the early 1980s. At the time, the Guadalajara cartel was under heavy fire from the government, which caused the cartel to break down into smaller groups, and one of those groups turned out to be the Sinaloa cartel. Under the leadership of infamous drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the cartel rose via brutality to prominence in Mexico. The National Drug Intelligence Center believes that the Sinaloa cartel's primary business is the distribution of cocaine, fentanyl, cannabis, methamphetamine, and heroin but they also engage in money laundering and various forms of racketeering. 
To date, the Sinaloa cartel sits at the top of the list of cartels in Mexico and is arguably the most powerful of them. The cartel built a strong reputation for violence and brutality because during El Chapo's reign, he didn't think twice about using violence. The Sinaloa cartel proved its power in 2015 when it broke El Chapo out of prison through an underground tunnel that was dug by the cartel's members. El Chapo seemed like a cat with nine lives, but it was only a matter of time before he ran out of time. In January 2016, El Chapo was arrested again, and this time the Mexican government immediately extradited him to the United States, where he is serving a life sentence in a supermax prison. El Chapo's incarceration did not do much to end the Sinaloa cartel, as his sons took over from where he left off and are still operating to date, and they have to deal with rival cartels like Los Zetas cartel. The Los Zetas cartel was formed in 1997, as an enforcement arm of the Gulf Cartel by Osiel Cardenas Guillen. The leadership of the Gulf Cartel was a bit shaky at the time, so Cardenas gathered a group of ex-military men to serve as his bodyguard and hitmen squad. The group continued to work for Cardenas until he was arrested and extradited. It didn't take long for the Los Zetas Cartel to break out of the Gulf Cartel as they were becoming twice as strong as the Gulf Cartel. Los Zetas officially announced their presence in Mexico in February 2010, and since then, they have brought the highest form of violence to the Mexican citizens. Being ex-military men, they had been trained for war and knew how to use the military top-class weapons. So they used this to their advantage by using violence as their first response to everything. The cartel increased in strength all over Mexico, hosting military training for recruits who wanted to join the cartel. The cartel grew so rapidly that at some point they became Mexico's largest cartel and were spread all over Mexico in terms of territory. For a while, the cartel controlled trafficking routes, protection rackets, extortion, and kidnappings. They worked hard to take down rival cartels, take over their territories, and make millions. However, this fast-earned victory only led the cartel to crash and burn within a short period. The Gulf Cartel joined forces with Sinaloa Cartel and La Familia Micoacana to fight Los Zetas, and they, in turn, seek for help from the Beltran Leyva Cartel, the Juarez Cartel, and the Tijuana Cartel. In the end, Los Zetas lost most of its members to infighting in the cartel and to the hands of the Mexican government. It's not surprising because, you see, they're no strangers to gang wars. But they probably meet their match in the form of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG. CJNG is one of Mexico's most brutal cartels founded by Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes aka El Mencho, a man whose name is on the list of the world's most wanted drug lords. The cartel originated when the Milenio cartel broke into small factions as a result of the death and capture of their leaders. El Mencho took the leadership of one of the small factions and turned it into the well-known and feared cartel it is today. The CJNG's major source of income is trafficking cocaine and methamphetamine, but they are also involved in all sorts of racketeering. The cartel's reputation is built largely on its ability to use aggression and extreme violence in its dealings. In the first few years of their existence, the cartel massacred dozens of people in states like Veracruz, Jalisco, Guadalajara, and Sinaloa. Another peculiar thing about the cartel is their eagerness to claim responsibility for anyone they kill. They absolutely enjoy getting public spectacle, so they are known to post very bizarre torture videos on social media for the world to see. Under L. Mencho's leadership, the cartel expanded its businesses into the United States and other countries, and as of 2020, the cartel was regarded as Mexico's most dangerous criminal organization and second most powerful cartel after the Sinaloa cartel. Interactions between cartels and Hells Angels Hells Angels members turn out to be a good option for cartels who may need help particularly because the club has chapters all over the United States and in other countries and can easily help the cartels who may not have branches in other countries. The relationship between cartels and Hells Angels is more likely to tilt toward alliances than battles because even though Hells Angels pride themselves as a motorcycle club, they have widened the scope of their business into drug trafficking. This means they have something in common with cartels, who are the major showrunners of the business. Even outside prison walls, Hells Angels members have been known to work with cartels, but the most famous incident where the club's members agreed to work for a famous drug lord came to light in 2019. During the long-awaited trial of infamous drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman in 2019, a witness's testimony helps to solidify our thoughts that the Outlaw Motorcycle Club helps out cartels whenever they can. The witness, Hildebrando Alexander Alex, Chifuentes Villa was one of El Chapo's trusted lieutenants in the Sinaloa cartel. In his testimony, Alex stated that he had a meeting with Canadian Hells Angels to arrange a hit on a Canadian real estate agent 
who got mixed up with El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel. According to Alex, the real estate agent turned drug trafficker known as Stephen Tello, or Catboy, had been working for El Chapo for years. Alex had worked for El Chapo for several years and earned his trust, so El Chapo put him in charge of all the drugs being sold to Canada. His job involved making drug deliveries to wholesalers in Canada, gathering the cash, and sending it back to the cartel to purchase more drugs. Tello was involved with the Canadian side of the business. He and Alex worked together to smuggle drugs into the United States by the use of trailers, helicopters, and boats. The relationship Tello had with the cartel seemed to be working fine for a while as they were making millions from the operations. Unfortunately for Tello, he was doing business with a hardened criminal, and it didn't take long for El Chapo to start calling for his head. El Chapo soon started suspecting that Tello was playing a shady game by mishandling the funds put in his care. Tello was either stealing the drugs to make a profit for himself, or he was outrightly stealing money that belonged to El Chapo. Hence, the drug lord made plans to eliminate him. El Chapo tried getting Tello to visit Mexico with the ulterior motive of killing him on arrival, but Tello turned down the offer. So El Chapo decided that if Tello wasn't going to come to Mexico, then he had to find someone in Canada who could help him complete the mission. So El Chapo reached out to the Canadian Hells Angels and hired them for the job. Fortunately for Tello, he was able to escape death because he was soon arrested and sentenced to 15 years in prison, but that was a far better fate than losing his life to the Hells Angels. While the deal with El Chapo didn't work out as planned, the Hells Angels' willingness to work for the drug lord may influence further interactions between the groups. Whether it be inside a prison or not, there is a large possibility of the two groups working together in the future as their line of business, which involves violence, may bring them closer or cause a rift between them. Prison Gangs and Their Dynamics it is largely uncommon for the interactions between various gangs in prison to be printed on the headlines of newspapers. However, there have been few occasions where the public has gotten a glimpse of what goes on between gangs behind bars. Hence, much of what we know is largely based on speculations formed from these events. Interactions between prison gangs may be violent or calm, depending on the groups and the situation of things. These interactions can broadly be classified into three groups which are alliances between gangs, competition in areas of illegal businesses run by gangs, and the need for a gang to stay at the top or control the prison. Let's start by looking at alliances. While prison gangs may be of different backgrounds and have different interests, there have been occasions when gangs asked for help or received help from other gangs. Two gangs may come together to form an unexpected alliance for various reasons, but the more common reasons are either to join forces to fight off another gang or work together to achieve a common goal. One example of such an alliance occurred between the Gulf Cartel and another prison gang. The cartel was in desperate need of help and decided to turn to the gang for help. At one point, during the reign of the Gulf Cartel in Mexico, a batch of the cartel's marijuana was stolen in an area they knew nothing about. It was obvious they didn't have the capacity to find their shipments on their own, so they asked for help from a prison gang known as Partido Revolucionario Mexicano, a gang founded by Mexicans that were imprisoned in Texas. The gang was familiar with drug dealers who lived around the county where the drug was stolen, so they agreed to help the cartels in investigating the theft. Members of the gang purchased the drug from drug dealers, whom they suspected, kidnapped them, and roughed them up to get information on who stole the drugs and where they hid them. Unfortunately, the drugs were never found as police intercepted the gang's plans. Cartels turning to prison gangs for help goes to show that although they may have their differences, the possibility of working together for the benefit of all is an option they would willingly take. In prisons, the struggle for power is another of the highest reasons for interactions between gangs. The stronger gangs call the shots in prison, they decide the way other gangs operate, and they dictate the prices of things sold in prisons and the rate at which each gang should do their business. However, there are times when these decisions do not favor all the parties involved, and that results in fights. Dozens of prisoners have lost their lives in the struggle for power and dominance that exists in prisons. An example of a prison fight that turned into a bloodbath occurred recently in Ecuador. The prison was said to be overcrowded with about 9,000 prisoners at the time of the incident. The ever-continuous rise in the number of cartels in the country continues to affect the number of cartel members thrown into jail every year. A struggle for power between rival gangs led to a riot that resulted in massive killings in the prison. Inmates came to the riots equipped with knives, machetes, glocks, and other sharp objects they could find. The unfortunate events ended with so many inmates losing their lives, government officials stated that the riot resulted in the death of 116 inmates and 78 others left injured. It gets worse, five bodies were found beheaded in the riot. The families of the dead were left devastated when they had to visit the morgue to identify their relatives' badly mutilated bodies from a pile. 
The struggle for power in prison is a menace that will continue to exist as long as prison gangs exist. It is only sad that these fights end up affecting other prisoners who just want to serve their time and leave. As more and more members of the Hells Angels Club are being sentenced to jail, they are bound to have these interactions with other gangs or cartels. If they already agreed to work for Chapo, it means they will be willing to do the same for other cartels as long as the pay is right. As I said, much of this information is based on speculation as we are not often privy to the intricacies of having various criminals locked up together. 